G'day guys, today we're going to talk about medieval chivalry. Medieval chivalry is, I think, a term which really describes, uh, I guess, the way that warriors, in this case knights, were really expected to behave and how they were supposed to function on the battlefield. It had a lot to do with that, or no, not exclusively. So let's take a little bit more of a look. Alrighty, so chivalry. Chivalry is a, it's a pathway. Uh, Chivalry is a word, uh, and, I, and I think the concept actually predates um, the, the medieval period, and it really goes back into the sort of classical period with the, the Romans and so on. When we're talking about Western Europe, and that's the, the focus of this channel, uh, is I think uh, you can definitely see particular behavioural expectations evolving through the Roman army. And then later uh, we saw um, some of the, the, uh, the European cultures start to, as they became stronger and they emerged through the migration period, we really started to see some uh, much clearer definition. We saw the evolution and formalization of some of the different household guard groups um, various names for those in different societies and different time periods. Um, but certainly by the time we get to the 10th century and we see the rise of the Norman kind of um, society, um, and obviously we all know about the, the Normans really evolving the concept of mounted cavalry, which was genuinely very different to what else was available uh, on the European battlefield at the time, we see, uh, I guess, the, the the sort of embryonic stage of chivalry. All right, so let's take a little bit of a look at what chivalry really was. Chivalry is broken down into, uh, I guess, a different, uh, a bunch of different topics, uh, and it did change through the time period, through the medieval period, and it also changed. Uh, according to the particular nobles or king that may be at the time, it also had cultural and religious differences. However, the context of chivalry really did remain very similar. Uh, and let's get into that. Okay, so the first part of chivalry is professionalism. Chivalry really defines um, the, the knight and how the knight behaved and acted and who they were responsible to and who they took orders from, that kind of thing. And so realistically, um, we have that, uh, you, you, there was not much point you being a knight if you were not capable of being professional. You had to be a warrior, you had to be, uh, and the function really of a warrior which I think is probably best described by the modern Australian army, is to close with and kill the enemy. All right, so the next part of chivalry is faithful. Uh, faithful really means, I guess, um, being faithful to your Lord. It means also uh, faithful to your, uh, your religion, which, which in the medieval period was Christianity. All knights really... Uh, in, certainly in Western Europe where we're Christians and, and that's just how that worked. The pathway into knighthood really started for a young boy, particularly around about the age of five or six. They were expected to be uh, incredibly good at a whole range of different tasks. They would really have been expected to be a master equestrian and they would have ex been expected to be uh, proficient and show willingness and leadership and tenacity and what we would call today resilience, those kind of qualities would be expected to be seen and demonstrated by a, a fairly young child. Um, 
uh, that young boy, because I say boy, all knights that we know of were male. And um, that's not to say that females didn't fight, and it's certainly not to say that females didn't do much of the roles of a knight. So certainly when the knight was away at battle or on campaign, then um, the, the wife would tend to step up into that role uh, and, and names or titles such as dame tend to come into this. And we'll explore her role um, much more in a future video. Alrighty, so now we're going to start to talk about charity. Knights lived a life of basically battle and conflict and violence. So really for a knight, um, there wasn't a whole lot of point in saving up for your retirement because the likelihood was you weren't going to get there. Um, so knights were expected to be able to demonstrate charity and assist the poor and the meek and the mild and to bring about, um, I guess, um, a bit of empowerment to these people. Justice. Part of a knight's role was to dispense justice. Uh, not necessarily just through, uh, in, a, in the circumstances of a battle, but a knight would also be expected to try relatively um, minor legal matters. Um, they may have to decide on the rights and wrongs of um, different sort of land ownership type cases or a lot of the local laws, the um, legal disputes that may arise from the knight's tenants. So typically speaking a knight would be um, uh, certainly an independent knight, may have his own castle but still be uh, subject to his local lord or baron, whatever that might be, um, but on his estate may well be, you know, a thousand or two thousand or even four thousand acres and living there may be, you know, two to five hundred people. Of those people, uh, there would be a whole range of different trades that would support the knight, things like blacksmiths, cooks, uh, textile makers, leather workers, armourers, blacksmiths, weaponsmiths, fletchers, bowsmiths, all sorts of different people that would be around about the functioning and the survivability and livability uh, of, of that particular uh, knight. And many of these people would in fact go on campaign with the knight. So when you hear about a knight going to war, a knight didn't just take you know, himself, it would be a whole bunch of people would go with that knight to, to help support that knight on campaign. Uh, honesty. So honesty, we, we would today call that integrity. So that's really doing the right thing, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's uh, and not just because it's what I've been ordered to do, but I'm doing the right thing because uh, that is what I feel is the right thing to do. That's my, my culture, that's my moral compass, that's my, my spiritual compass, all kicking in and, and saying the same thing. And doing the right thing even when no one's looking. So... I'm, what I'm referring to there is, is uh, I guess, um, often people, I guess, tend to, to perhaps do the right thing when, or behave in a certain way when people are aware of it, but when they're on their own, they may not behave in that way. So, uh, honesty and integrity were a big thing. Now, I realise, obviously, that, that many knights did not behave necessarily in this way when they were supposed to. Um, but, but this is what the knights were supposed to do. This was their code of, of behaviour. A prowess. So again, this doesn't just come back to professionalism, but prowess is how I project myself on the battlefield. I want to make sure that um, a, a knight, for instance, wore his surcoat and he would have his colours on his shield so the people, the scribes of the time, would be able to record his deeds and acts. So the knight wants to be able to demonstrate his courage and bravery and his professionalism uh, and he wants to be seen and recorded for doing all the right things. And he also wants to make sure that um, you know, he's, he's, he's being merciful when that, that, that's the right time to be merciful but also being uh, ruthless when it's time to be ruthless. A generosity. So a knight would be expected to be generous and, and as I say, um, give out money into charities and help support uh, people when they needed it. It's not just about finance, but also about through skills or through um, 
that kind of thing at the time. Uh, franchise. So by franchise, I'm not talking about the whole modern kind of, you know, fr the concept of franchise. We think of franchises as, as opening up, you know, multiple retail outlets or restaurants that all do the same thing. That's not what I'm talking about at all. So franchise in a medieval concept was passing on his skills. So knights would typically have at least one, sometimes four or even six squires. And those squires would be boys typically aged from about the age of 12. And so if I had multiple squires, they would probably be different ages, perhaps in different areas. And I guess um, my, my job there as a knight would be to transfer my skills to that, those boys. So um, I'm talking not just about the weapons, but I'm talking about equestrian skills and, and being able to... Um, follow my example in religion and service and fortitude and in fealty and my example in generosity and, and all these other all-encompassing sorts of terms and, and ethoses that are laid out in chivalry. The next one is fealty. So in fealty, uh, I'm not just talking here about, uh, um, and this definitely changed much throughout the ages, fealty is about um, service to the Lord and, and, and King and not necessarily questioning or not pushing back on that. Um, we, we see a lot of this I think especially through the Crusades and through you know the Hundred Years War and so on. Um, I, I think there's different uh, historical examples of where knights have pushed back and questioned. Um, there were some really good examples, I'll, I'll leave them in the description below. And we're, we're talking about um, where knights have done this, and, uh, and the knights really weren't supposed to. Uh, the, the concept of fealty is, is being able to do your job even though it might be scary and might be dangerous and may very well lead to your death. That's just the part of being a knight, really. But we also know that, um, you know, if we look in the history books and we're honest about it, we also do know that there were many acts undertaken that uh, people did disagree with because they, their morals and their, conf their religious beliefs conflicted with the orders of the day and uh, often that would mean that the knight may lose his, his title and his lands and um, as all of those things provided him with wealth then that knight may in fact end up as destitute and poor. Alrighty, so the last one is nobility. So nobility, uh, I think, is a very interesting one, uh, possibly the most interesting of all of them. So nobility is not just about uh, a birthright, but nobility is is being noble through your actions and being noble through your the way that you express yourself in in a professional context. Uh, typically speaking, knights were a, a an elite class and always were right back into the 10th century from the Norman lands. But we know very well that uh, there were many examples of knights who came from just the, the ordinary classes. So what may happen in those examples would be that uh, a knight has disobeyed his lord or a knight has committed a crime uh, or a knight has, has, has committed an act of cowardice and it's caught the attention of his lord. His lord has essentially sacked him and um, he now has a vacancy within his ranks. He may very well choose someone who's not of noble birth um, and he may very well say, rightio, well, you know what, I'm looking for someone who has shown these qualities and it may be that in a, in a previous battle that a, just an, an ordinary peasant or an ordinary person uh, an ordinary free person has in fact demonstrated acts of bravery and courage sufficient enough to be noticed and that person may be recommended to become a knight and would therefore follow the pathway of being a squire and once they were ready they would then become um, uh, knighted and find their way into the ranks of the knights. So there we go guys, there's a look at chivalry in the medieval period. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.